As Jim mentioned, my mother came from Massachusetts. She was born and raised in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, her family was raised there. Her brother happened to be, became a farmer and ended up moving to Westport for a bigger farm so that he could continue his, his uh, gardening business. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uncle was just a wonderful man. I used to go out there just to stand next to him. He was that kind of man. I was really impressed with him. And uh, he was the bake master for a while. And as it's turned out, they've had a number of bake masters through the years that I've gone back. And uh, the late ones have been, well, my uncle. And his son-in-law became the bake master after him. And we've had a number of them since. And the last two that have done the last two bakes are both third cousins of mine. So I go back and it's family reunion all the time. That, that's one of the major things I love about it. And I just love the history of this clam bake. So let me let me uh, talk about a little bit. Go ahead. You'll notice it's Westbourne on the, on the left side and Dartmouth on right. And these two villages are about halfway between New Bedford, Massachusetts, and we just lost it. Fall River. Mm -hmm. Fall River. We're about halfway in between that, you know, any of the geography. And of course, uh, the blue arrow is the rock is Turtle Rock Farm, which had to be the farm my uncle bought. So when we would go out there, Shar and I, we would stay with my first cousin at Turtle Rock Farm. And you, you go down and you'll see two arrows. The orange one is where we collect the rock weed in order to make the bait work. And the yellow one there is the clam bait grounds. That clam bake started in 1887 as a picnic. And uh, it got to be such a big picnic and a lot of guests were coming. They started selling tickets for it. And, and it's just developed into this this bake that serves 600 people, 500 paying customers, and 100 volunteers. There's the, the meeting house, and that's what the Quakers call their church, a meeting house, very plain, but absolutely New England picturesque. It has a little cemetery on the side in which my uncle JT is buried. Uh, I love, Sharon, I love going out east and one of the real pleasures is to go in this little church and listen. And I don't really know much about the Quaker background, but normally, to begin with, they had no ministers. The members would come in and sit quietly until somebody had a revelation that they had to share or some story or whatever, and then they would speak up. And that's, that was their church service. They, they mentored one another. Nowadays, they have a minister to make it go a little bit easier, but they still have that quiet period. And sometimes they last 20 to 30 minutes. And I'm going to tell you what, when I was first going out there for a Presbyterian from the Midwest, buddy, that stuff to handle. That's a lot of quiet. Yes, I love to tell a story. They had a, a wind up clock on the wall, and you know, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And then as they had the quiet period, it would go on, and pretty soon it was tick tock, tick tock. And then pretty soon it was tick tock, tick tock. It just gets louder and louder. That was stolen, by the way. What? That clock. Uh, New Bedford, as you might know, was known as the Whaley Capital of the World. And it brought in a bunch of Portuguese to do the, to work on the ships. And, and consequently, there's a huge Portuguese. Uh, there are a lot of Portuguese people in that whole eastern area. And it's interesting because they have melded in with the, the Yankees. And at this moment, the two, the, the two bake masters are both third cousins of, of mine. And one of them has an English background from New Bedford. And the other one has a Portuguese background. So they melded in, and, and there are a lot of Yankees with the name of Vincent or something like that. This advertisement just tells about it, advertises for it. Notice the tickets are 75 cents. 
I really like that. They are now fifty dollars <laughs> per ticket at this bait, and they do not serve lobster at this particular bait. It's interesting. On if you go out in the summer, in August, probably you could go to a clam bait, a big clam bait, uh -huh. at least once a week for probably four or five weeks. The firemen put one on. Uh, some of the local uh, agencies put them on, and the Quaker bake is the longest one in the United States, the longest ongoing bake. And although they don't serve lobsters, some others do, and everyone's done just a little bit differently. We're going to show you how they do this one. This is a fundraiser? Mm -hmm. It has become a fundraiser. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it's you know it's turned into the one thing I like about it. It's probably one of the largest reunions you could have. Char and I go out there to bake, and we might have thirty or forty relatives there, and, and the younger ones that we don't know well, we get acquainted with at bake, and that's one of the big draws for me. Other than the fact that I love working on it. So they started in a F. I, had a small lot in front of the church for their first picnics, and it eventually it, it's moved to a number of different places. But right now, it is in a copse of woods that they bought specifically for the clam bake. And they cleared out enough trees that they could put down structures for tables and benches. And those are permanent. They have a small block building, small small building on the lot where they store stuff in the winter mm -hmm. and use it for melting the butter, making the coffee, and protecting the pies. I had to work there, box in the hen house. So they've got a nice area that, uh, to put this in and shade a, a really lacy shading during a nice sunny day. They need one full dry uh, cord of dry hardwood in four foot lengths. And we'll, show, we'll build that for you and show you how it goes. We get one dump truck load of rockweed. One, one and a half tons of stones about the size of a cantaloupe melon cannot be used the next year. All clam bakes are not alike. They vary in menu as I've mentioned already. And Alan's neck almost <coughs> always has the same menu. But we have one story. The new minister came in who was a really great guy. But after his first or second clam bake, he went to the committee and said, I think that your dressing, which they've been making for over 100 years, same recipe, a cracker, dry cracker dressing. He said, I think it needs some cohogs in it. And that set off a tizzy. <laughs> you know, a change is difficult. And there were a handful that were making the, the, making the dressing, and they agreed to try it. So they tried it one year. They got cohogs, washed them, and you'll see that in there. They added the cohogs, and everybody liked it so much, they've never changed again. Uh, all this goes into it, the clams, the dressing, uh, breakfast sausage, uncooked, onions, fish, watermelons, tripe no longer is in. That used to be my mother's favorite part of the, the uh, Bake, but they no longer put the tripe in. The homemade pies we have to protect now. Sweet corn, lots of melted butter, sweet potatoes, a lot of coffee and bottled water. Those are the ingredients for this bake. Group of enthusiastic workers, and, and like I said, this is a homecoming and a reunion. And it's interesting, you're going to see a workstation in there that can handle about 30 people <coughs> putting the, the food together, preparing it. Because most of the food <coughs> gets put in big racks that have a screen bottom. And they, some of them put it, the corn and the, the yams are put in, in raw. The uh, fish and the sausage are put in little brown paper bags. Tops twisted and they go in one of these bins. Uh, but at this work table, you're going to see all these people working, and I want to tell you what, I looked at it one day, and I said, they range from five years old to 95, a group of 30, 
and probably 80% of them did not belong to that church. I think that's just a fantastic deal that we all come back, some people from further than Michigan, to work on this faith. Uh, the clams have to be cold and washed. You're going to see that process. They used to do it in seawater at a boat at Horseneck Beach. They, they have a, a rowboat on the, on the shore. They bring buckets of seawater, put it in there, and then they would let these uh, clams work for a while in the sun, and then they would wash off any rough on the outside and never would allow a dead clam or a cracked clam in the bait. Sweet corn, we do this 17th, no, the third Thursday in August, always. And sweet corn comes from a farmer probably five miles away at the most. Harvested that morning, brought to the bait. Rock wheat is fresh, we, we cut that or pull that the day before the bait, take it to the grounds, put it in a big pile and put a tarp over it. It's interesting because this is a church service that we do all this work in the morning and then they, the bake master will test one plan to make sure that it's completely done. And when he approves that, the minister gets up on top of that, that work table and gives the prayer for the meal. And then everybody goes to their to their uh, designated seats ready to be served. 500 guests, 125 workers. They limit it to that? Yeah. Say what? They limit it to that? Say it again. They limit it to 500 and... I, I think they serve 525, <coughs> they sell 525 tickets. And they, they can quit, but that's, uh, that's what they're set up for in this, in this woods and there's not much room for anything else. This goes back to the old days, to show you how they were harvesting the uh, rock wheat. Get the cohogs. And uh, let me tell you about cohogs. That we, they use cohogs for the dressing, but we use steamer clam for the bait. And there's a big difference. Steamer clam, oh, normally about three to four inches long, and maybe a couple of inches wide, fairly small, but they're a sweet, sweet clam. Mm -hmm. We get clams here in Michigan, and they're almost always little necks or, uh, I think little necks. Little necks, yeah. And uh, I find that there's just no comparison to the sweet clams we get at bait. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, the ones that we get here are normally pretty chewy and I think fairly tasteless where these uh, clams that you'll see in here are bright, bright yellow with a shiny, shiny black snorkel and, uh, and sweet. Here they're catching, catching herring at Mattapoiset on the Cape, and that's the fish that they would use in the bait. Nowadays, another change that they made for the years is one of the son-in-laws in this big family line out there worked for Freenor Fish Company. And that was one of those companies, a Norwegian company, took these huge boats out to sea, caught the fish, processed them, froze them on the boat, bring them in, froze them. And he went to the board one time when they were getting ready for the bait, and he said, uh, I can get you frozen fish. Oh, they were just horrified. <laughs> horrified that they used frozen fish. Uh, but then he told them the price. Yankees are tight. And they said, well, we'll try, because the price was way different from fresh. So they tried them, and they've used them ever since. They were wonderful, wonderful fish. So that's one of them that they always include. Now, gathering the rockweed is a, is a day of its own, because they pick normally the Wednesday before the, before the bait, and it has to be at low tide. And we go to what was at one time a horseman's farm. One of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen is this Tuckerman's farm. He was the commissioner of racing, horse racing in New York State. It went down, he was a very rich man. He had a great big house on top of the hill that overlooked what you're seeing right now. And he was up even higher. This is one of the pastures. In fact, as we're down at the, they put a wharf in down back there. We're at 
river level at low tide. But we go through about three levels coming from the barn, this guy's horse farm, and we go through these pastures, these beautiful pastures, every one surrounded by rock falls. Absolutely picturesque. And then you keep dropping down, and as you see, there's a wooded area in there toward the base. And all those rocks back there in the water is what we collect the rock we from. Now, there are a number of different kinds of seaweed in the river like this, but the rock weed attaches itself to the rocks. And you'll see it has little blisters on the leaves. And that's the, that's the seaweed they want. Some of the others have similar, somewhat similar, maybe smaller, but they don't have the right taste. And this, this rock weed gives the right taste, and there's plenty of seawater in those blisters to give off the steam they need to make the bait work. We go along with, uh, nowadays, we go along with burlap, or not burlap bags, plastic bags, and fill them with rock weed that we pull off those rocks. The old timers used to take hand size and cut it off, but we find it's faster. Now this is a heck of a job because there's a pickup, or a truckload, not truckload of seaweed in those bags, and it's all wet, so they're heavy, uh, and they'll take that up to the grounds and, and dump them. This is headed up the hill. Now, they use the cohogs for the dressing, and they do that normally on the Wednesday before. There's a group of women that know the recipe, and we go in. I go in and help them wash the clams, and they steam it, and they're still hard to get open. We have to work hard to get them open, but then they'll, they'll uh, mix all the ingredients in the tub and mix it all together and get that ready. It will go into the aluminum trays, and then they'll put a cloth over the top, tie it with a string. And those are the things that go on the bait last because that's mushy and not in anything really. This is the uh, kitchen at the meat house, by the way. They go through, oh, I guess I don't remember what it said, how many onions? 100? 100? 100 pounds, yeah. And, and we do this, that's the, 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 uh, the house that they've got there the, at the grounds. And uh, the last few years we've been cutting onions out there, trying to get a crew together the same day. And uh, we'll go out there and we have to cut both ends off, peel them, and we put those in pots. That's the only thing in the bait, no, that's one of the things in the bait that is not done in the bait. I think they used to be, but they didn't like the way it tainted the taste. So now we clean the onions, put them in those big pots, and we do about, I think about eight of those pots on charcoal grill and, and boil them there. The boy on the, on the right is a Vincent, and that's his son there. Those are both relatives of mine, third and fourth cousins. You'll see in the back a stack of wood. That's brought in probably the week of the bait and stacked there. That's very important. And there's two different sizes. They have big logs, and they have all these limbs that are about three to four inches across. They're the rocks that they'll use in the bait. That's a, that's a fresh load somebody's brought in from the rock. Rock Can you use those over year after year? No. Cannot use them over. They, they'll, they get so hot that they crack and they, they won't do the same job. So it's always fresh. Now here's the building, and this is very, very important. It is probably the most important thing of the bait, just for visual, if nothing else. Just to have the fun. They take these, these stringers uh, you see one of the end, the butt end of one of them here, and they'll they'll take that that whole line. That's about 15 foot long, and they'll put two of those big stringers down there, and then over the stringers they'll put these smaller limbs, and then they'll put another stringer, two stringers on the side, and they'll fill that tier with rocks, and then they'll put limbs across, and then a couple more stringers, and they'll fill that with rocks. You can see the two lower tiers have rocks in them. And then underneath they'll stuff a bunch of paper and kindling to get it started. It's quite an art building this because when it's built and when it burns, notice the Yankees are using the old logs from last year, didn't burn enough. Uh, every tier is filled with those rocks. 
and it's built in such a way that when it burns, all the rocks fall in the middle. Now, if we get a wind, you'll see in one of these pictures that they've actually put some logs up against one side to brace it. But this is a magnificent fire when this gets going, and it goes for oh, an hour and a half, two hours, until it burns down. And they watch it pretty closely because I've, I've known them to take tarps out there and, and uh, brace them up so they keep the wind from blowing too hard on one side. They do not want that stuff to tip over. They want to go straight down. And by the way, all of the wood will be removed. They do not want any charcoal in the bake because that makes it too smoky a flavor. It'll be smoky enough with just the rocks and the little bit that, that stays on there. There's the work table in the back, and you see the folks back there working on it. Looks like they're cutting corn there at this moment. They cut both ends of the corn off, take half the shucks, and then they put those in those wire bottom pins. Yeah, see, they're trying to hold that one side up a little bit. At this bake, they have a sale table, and, and they'll, if you see one length of that, that's, there's three lengths, one here, and then it makes a U, and they'll fill that full of jams and jellies and flowers and hand-knit hot pads and birdhouses, anything anybody wants to donate for sale. And, and uh, 500 people, and many of them quite well to come to this, uh, they really, uh, they do well on that sale table. They like it. There's Troy looking over them. There are the bins I'm talking about, and that bottom is uh, hardware cloth, screen. Where is it? Huh? Where is it? This is that the bake on, out east. Now there's the work table. Corn just came in from nearby farm. See, they throw them in that box right there until it's level. And those, then those will all be stacked on it. Here are the clams. They come down from Maine. Every year they seem to have to go further and further to Maine to get the amount of clams that they need. But they now wash them on the site, which is a great thing because you see the kids are in there. They've got all these people that are there and they just they line up, they wash the clams, they rinse them, and they're putting them in uh, coffee cans, in bags now. They put a net bag in the coffee can, fill it, and that's an individual server. When the bake comes off, the first thing people get, it used to be a strawberry basket full of clams, and now it's a net bag full of clams, the same amount. <laughs> They put those in the same bins to be steamed, and they go next to the top because they're the first things they want out. It's, uh, they were putting the fish in tinfoil this past couple years. It was always in brown paper bags before. It, it's fun to watch this when they Dark. Stand aside just for a little bit. Okay. Uh, when this starts getting down, all these firemen and all these big rugged guys, these macho guys come in and they're really dressed for the work. You see the firemen in their full dress with their heavy bottom shoes and these rocks have been burned on a cement slab. And now you see they got rakes or hooks, forks to pull the rocks off so they can clean that uh, cement slab off. I think we got a shot of that. Thank you, right. No, we don't. They, anyway, they, they clean that off with wooden plows on a 12-foot pole, and two guys will take one of those and push it through at a time, and they run through, and then another team takes over, and they run through till the cement is clean. All of the charred logs are rolled off to the side, and then the the rocks are assembled so that they have a nice, even surface on them. And then they put the rock weed right directly on those white hot rocks. The sizzle and the steam comes up, it's, it's uh, really quite a sight. 
And you see the people ringing this. They, this is the show. This is the show they've come to see, and it's, they're never disappointed. They're sealing the outside of the tarps they put in. They put about six tarps on top, and then sealed it with a seaweed to hold it down so it holds the steam inside as the steam is made. And it, it'll puff right up. They, they took a small version, a half version of the bait to uh, the National, what's the, what's the, the National Museum uh, facade, what is it? The Smithsonian. And uh, they had to carry everything there to the truck. So they, they put everything in refrigerated trucks and drove over there. Mm -hmm. They set it up and did a bake right there. And they had all these states doing different things. It was, uh, it was something that their state would do. It would be like a national something. It, it didn't have to be food, but much of it was. They got it already, got, them, got the rocks all hot, put the seaweed on, put the food on, put the tarps on, and they never billowed up. And they couldn't believe it. They never had this passion. Well, the bait took way, way longer, and it finally got cooked. And they found out that they refrigerated the seaweed, <laughs> and they'd never done that before. And it, it took so much more heat because it was cold. That was really a neat demonstration they did there. Here are the onions are working on the on the uh, barbecue, and the pies start coming in. They, they're almost everyone homemade, and and the, the 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 girl in the blue there is in charge of this now. Generations take over. It, it's really fun to watch. Uh, they're cutting them individual pieces, putting them on those plates. And they're putting those plates in those orange bread cases. Yeah. And they're stackable. Oh, look at it. Take your pick. <laughs> Are you getting hungry? Go for it. And here's an interesting story. Part of, the, part of the bait, the Quakers are lovely, compassionate people. And one year, they, they used to have a wooden rack. And the pies always went on the wooden rack. That worked great. So when it was nine to five, they'd go over and take them off the rack and deliver them to the tables. Well, one year they had a bunch of hippies. It must have been in the 70s, 60, yeah. late 60s or 70s. Had a bunch of hippies in there, and they wanted to come work the bakery. They said, sure, come on in. Well, when it came time to serve the pie, they weren't quite enough for, for, for the paying customers because they'd gone in, the, the workers had snitched what they wanted to get in some place. And so from that day on, yeah. we now put them in that cook shack, mm -hmm. and I guard them. <laughs> and, and, and they're so organized about it. There's a, a, a young, young woman who's probably my fourth or fifth cousin. She, she counts how many are in each one of these racks, and she makes enough of those racks mm -hmm. to fill one table, or to serve one table. Now we've got 12 different tables that are probably 30, 40 feet long. And so she, she knows how many they see, and she makes enough pies in uh, different, different varieties to serve each one of those lengths of the table. And she knows that there's enough pie for everyone. And then they do a couple extras because people like to trade and turn one in for something different. And anyway, at the end of the bake, they had to have special runners from the table because each table, each length of the table has a crew, a crew chief, and she gets her, or he gets her, or his helpers, and they do the one table. And every table has their own crew. So they, they've got special tickets in their, on their apron when they come to get pies. They've got to be a pie runner where they don't get pies. Mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody gets, well, it's kind of fun the, the way they do it, and it's very, very well organized. But there's almost always pie left over. The volunteers don't get anything except what's left over from the bait. Yeah. But they also make sure that there's plenty there. Some years they run out of clams, some years they'll run out of corn, or whatever. But uh, it, it, 
Jim said a true thing. I, I found that I work in the cook shack, and at the end of the bake, when the food comes out, you know, one of the girls will run over there and grab us a couple of plates of food, and I find that I eat very, very little uh, because it's been such an exhausting day, but so rewarding. A lot of flowers on the sale table. We got to thank Jim for these photos. I'm telling you what, Jim is a masterful photographer. That year that the two of us went out together, he did this. He did, uh, what's the Greenfield Village out there, Jim? Sturbridge Village. Sturbridge Village. And we did Mystic. Mystic Connecticut on the way home. And he, he did only, I think he only did 1,500 at each one. <laughs> oh, maybe it was 1,600. This is the brown bread, and that's one of the things put on the table ahead of time that's, that comes in cans. If I can, brown bread, because not too many people make that anymore, mm -hmm. but it's always on the tables. They set the tables up with white paper and then put a string across and they put plates underneath there. The string is keeping from blowing away. Sometimes it works. <laughs> you see, each one of these is, is a length of, of table. There's a one alleyway in between so you can get to them, but yeah. there it is. And they'll be filled with people and they'll all get a quart of glands first thing. Okay. Melted butter will be on. See, he's helping. Yeah, they did. <laughs> There's Peter Crysdale of Minnesota. They They're a brilliant man. I, in this church, when Sharon and I first started going there, if we if there were eight people in church, that was full. And we, would not, my family would go out there, we just about double it. But this guy was brilliant, and he built the, the, the church up a little bit. And I just, I'd love to go out there just to listen to him listen to him preach. But he's the one that stated that the dressing needed some coal hogs. Boy, and there was, there was a firestorm for a while. He's up here giving some announcement in preparation to saying the prayer. You see everybody around there, and that's all the way over 360 degrees around that table. The people are so deep you can hardly see. He gets up on that table and gives the prayer, and then everybody off to their seats. The tarps come off. Clams come off. And as they take this food off, it goes over that work table. And then the crews, the table crews come over and pick up what they need and take it to their tables. Sweet potatoes over there, corn in the bottom. <laughs> How do you get them open? They open when they get hot. Okay. And, but you have, there's, a, there's a procedure. There's, you have to open them further so you can expose the clam inside. You pull the clam off, and then the snorkel or the snout of that clam has a abrasive sheathing over it. And then that sheathing continues down around the body, and you have to put your thumbnail underneath that and pull that off the snout. And that takes that whole membrane off of the outside of the clam, exposing this beautiful yellow clam with this shiny, shiny black snow. Here they are eating. Cook shack in the back. There's the clam. Now you see on the right hand side that, that grayish thing, that's the, the, the sheathing and it goes all the way around the clam. Yeah. So you have to put your thumb in right, right there between the uh, yellow meat and that clam and that, pull that off and then down the gullet. Mm. Dip it in butter first. Yeah. Ooh. They all skip for dessert, but besides the pies they get watermelon. And then the cleanup. It is a mess when it's done. It is really good. This is the workers scrounging for what, whatever left in there. <clears throat> Where does all that seaweed and stuff go? 
Where are you? Uh, I'm in the dump. <laughs> they, they, they have in the back a, uh, a dumpster, a, a, a roll away. Okay. And they'll fill that full of trash before the day is up. We'll clean the, the grounds up. Mm -hmm. And all the trash goes in there. There, see that? There's one of the five thingies. I'm checking the tag to make sure it's legitimate. Right there. <laughs> Here we are. Washing the dishes up. They all get together and wash all the serving dishes and everything mm -hmm. before they leave. Do a good job. Your food is good. There goes the seaweed. <laughs> yeah. And the clam shells from years past. Yeah. Ready for next year. Yeah. I never thought about that because we always just cut it my, uh, put it in. There's my cousin Jean, who growing up I just assumed she was my aunt because she was 20 years older than I. Jean died at the age of 94 as did two of her brothers. My mother's, her, her father was 94 when he died. My mother was 93 when she died. And Uncle Joe was 94. Jean was 92 or 3 when she died. This is on her back porch. That's one of the most lovely women I have ever known. That's my cousin Jean. <laughs> Next. <laughs> she was a painter, too. Oh, she was a what? Painting pictures. Oh, yeah. She's good. She knows how to do that. 